The anime begins with Yusato, who is a loser high schooler with nothing going on in his life, bad grades, no friends, no girls, he wishes he was in a fantasy world to cure his boredom of being an ordinary loser, but one day someone steals his umbrella and he decides to wait for the rain to pass because princesses cannot get wet. Suddenly, the student council president Susan arrives and warns him the school is about to close. Yusato takes it as a clue to get his ugly face out of her sight, but Vice President Kazuki appears the typical perfect dude and claims that he will let Yusato have his spare. They ask if he wants to walk home with them and he cannot believe he gets the chance to walk with the cool kids. As they walk, Yusato tries to give his best shot and asks if there are couples. The two explain those are just rumors because they spend tons of time together in the student council. Susan asks if Yusato has some plans for the future, but he plans to stay in his mom's basement. Susan then reveals that she doesn't have any plans either because she accomplishes all her goals pretty fast. She reveals that for that reason, she feels isolated and doesn't think she belongs to this world. Suddenly, Susan and Kazuki stop. Yusato is confused, and Kazuki asks if he heard the bell but Yusato doesn't. They hear the bell again, this time even louder. He gets closer when suddenly a magic circle appears under their feet. Kazuki starts to freak out as Yusato claims they're being summoned to another world. Susan smiles while asking if he means that they will reach a place full of magic, monsters, and heroes. Seconds later, they open their eyes to find themselves inside a strange room with a guy sitting on a throne. The old man introduces himself as Lloyd, the King of Linger. The old man explains they have been summoned as heroes and the usual garbage. There's a demon lord who resurrected and is currently raising its armies. The kingdom has been attacked for the past two years but they barely survived. Their last hope was to summon heroes from another world to fight against the demon lord. Kazuki asks them to return them to their world, but the king explains that's not possible. Kazuki continues his caring mode, mentioning they all have families and stuff, but the king kneels in front of Kazuki, promising to find a way to send them home after the job is done. The mage Welsi reveals that the summoning spell seeks people who have the potential to become heroes. In short, everyone with that potential will hear a bell ringing. Susan and Kazuki understand that condition, but realize that Yusato got here by accident. They then go into Welsi's room to check their magical aptitude. Susan happily touches a crystal ball and a yellow glow appears. Welsi explains that this means that she can use thunder magic. Kazuki then touches the crystal ball and it turns white. Welsi explains he has a light attribute, which is the strongest attribute because it counters the demon lord. Yusato decides to try it too, but there's a flash of green. Susan and Kazuki think that's a beautiful and calming color, but Welsi freaks out. She grabs Yusato's hand and runs back into the throne room. There she tells the king about Kazuki and Susan's huge potential, but there is a problem Yusato. The king laughs, but gets shocked when he learns the crystal turned green. The king tells Welsi to shut up, making Yusato think his attribute is bad. The king starts to plot, mentioning they must take Yusato as far away from the castle as possible. Then King tells his guards to make preparations, and Yusato asks if he's dangerous and if there is someone else with his attribute. The King freaks out as he replies yes, but that person is bad news. Suddenly, a woman walks into the throne room, scaring everyone. This is the person the King was talking about. She asks the King how the summoning ritual went and if the heroes are already there, the King tries to play it cool, but she notices Yusato and asks who he is. The King explains he was summoned by mistake along with the heroes. He calls Yusato an average pleb, but she clearly notices the king is sweating. She asks for his name and introduces herself as Rose, the captain of the rescue team. Welsi intervenes, mentioning the heroes are waiting by the crystal ball, and tells her she will take Rose there. Rose accepts that and prepares to leave. The king feels relieved everything went well, but Yusato wants to know what his magic attribute means. He stupidly asks what a green light means. Upon hearing those words, Rose stops. Everyone inside the room starts to freak out. Rose turns back and asks if he just said green, Yusato confirms and she tells the king that she will be taking Yusato with her. The king freaks out and Welsi casts a spell, creating a bubble around Yusato and forcing him out of the castle, yet Rose dashes outside with her insane speed. Welsi Bubble gets out of the window and tries to take him as far as possible outside the kingdom. However, Rose's speed and power enable her to catch up with him. She then punches the bubble breaking it. Yusato thinks he's done for, yet Rose manages to reach and catch him. She tells the king that she will turn Yusato into a proper healer and walks away. Minutes later, Welsi explains to Susan and Kazuki that Yusato was taken. They're worried he might be in danger, 
but Welsey explains that's not the case because he was taken to the rescue squad. She reveals that Yusato's attribute is healing magic. Healers are rare in this world and Rose is one of them. Welsey continues to explain that Rose will teach Yusato everything she knows, but her training methods are unorthodox. After reaching the base, Rose explains Yusato has the potential to become a healer. He's pretty confused, and she reveals he will be living here from now on. She then calls the rest of the members, but when Yusato looks at them, he realizes they're literally a band of bandits. Rose tells them to take care of Yusato, but they all look at him like serial killers. He tries to back away while scared in fear, but the guys introduce themselves, which looks more like a robbery. Rose then explains they all belong to the squad, but are not healers. In fact, her rescue squad has only two more healers, but they're stationed somewhere else, which is why she will personally teach him about healing magic. Yusato freaks out, his instincts are telling him to scream and run, but he can't move. He tries to ask for another instructor, but she ignores him while saying that training starts tomorrow. The bandit gang smiles at him and tells him how miserable his life will become because Rose will be teaching him. In short, he will be living in hell. The next day Yusato meets Kazuki and Suzun, who are relieved that he's alright. He apologizes for worrying them but remembers that Rose exists and that she will train him starting today. The two are surprised about this supposed hellish training and asked if he's prepared. Yusato confirms mentioning he has nothing else to do because he wants to be able to help them someday. Rose suddenly steps outside and asks if the heroes are gone, Yusato gets scared to return to reality and doesn't reply, Rose then explains he's not in prison and he can meet his friends when he wants, as long as he is in training. Yusato thanks her and she gives him a diary to write down his training program experiences or whatever he wants. His fast day of training was opposite of hell, in short, his first task was to concentrate and relax, he feels something on his chest and Rose explains that's magic and she will teach him how to project it out of his body. After finishing that training Rose orders him to read a book. Using the images Rose explains their current location and where the demons live, since they're close to each other Linger is the demon's first target. She tells him to read the book as he will learn about the world, nations, races, and demons. Yusato starts reading it thinking this training is easy. However, the next couple of days was different, as Rose forced him to run until his body couldn't handle it anymore. Yet, every time his legs gave up but Rose slapped them with healing magic and orders him to run again, Yusato gets up and runs for his life but she tells him that even if he dies, she will heal him back to life just to make him run. Yusato thinks she's out of her mind but he decides to vent about it on his diary. On the six days, Rose thought he was slow and insulted him, he ends up hugging the floor and again decides to vent on his diary. However, while trying to get up he notices that his hand is glowing, he's confused that it looks like healing magic but doesn't understand why it's activating. Days 8 and 9 were pretty much the same, run into exhaustion get slapped or kicked and repeat it for the whole day. However, without noticing Yusato was healing himself every time he got injured, he later realizes that he's using healing magic as second nature and starts running again without being ordered to. Yet, things change on the 10th day since he now knows how to use magic, he can now run without getting tired. However, he still had doubts if he could help Kazuki or Susan as he could only run but Rose added 1000 push-ups to his training program. Yusato knows he cannot do it by himself, that's why he continues to use healing magic to make sure his body can handle it. Rose then reveals she's forcing him to train his body because he needs to run from the enemy on the battlefield and save his fallen comrades. Therefore, the faster he runs the faster he will be able to save them, Yusato is surprised by those words but she orders him to continue doing push-ups. He continues the training but is surprised that Rose didn't yell at him, he thinks he should be happy about it but in reality he's scared. He quickly got used to this training and rose and added some weights while he ran. On the 21st day, Kazuki, Princess, and a knight. Upon arriving there, they get shocked to see Yusato doing push-ups with Rose sitting on a huge rock on top of him. She complains that he's too slow and motivates him to not quit but our boy grows a pair and says that this is too easy because she's light, Rose then place another rock on top of the other. Despite the initial shock of regret, Yusato continues using his magic to heal himself, Rose even admires his determination saying that he's becoming her type of guy. The other two cannot believe Yusato is going through this but Susan quickly starts drooling after checking his muscles. However, the knight gets angry and grabs Rose's collar asking why she's trying to destroy Yusato, Rose grabs his hand and she tells him that she will use her methods to make Yusato become her right hand man. She claims that Yusato is a catch because he hates losing but what she loves the most is that he doesn't give up, Rose then orders him to take a break and have lunch. 
While resting under a tree, Yusada finds out that the guy is the kingdom's strongest knight his name Siglis, he is the one who's teaching Kazuki and Susan how to use the sword. Yusada finds it impressive Kazuki then asks if Yusada's training has always been as bad as just now, Yusada simply replies that today was pretty easy, Susan decide to check out our boy's muscles, despite him being shy about it, she's all into his huge abs even the princess cannot contain her curiosity. Kazuki then continues explaining that he felt like Yusato was having a hard time, Yusato confirms that he wanted to run in the beginning but he's fine now because he enjoys training and life here. Susan is impressed that he already found a place to belong, he shows his healing magic and explains he also wants to help them. Susan uses this chance to flirt, telling him to save her when she needs it. Yet, Yusato simply tells her it's too late to act like a normal girl, she gets mad but even the princess agrees with him. The next day, Rose gives him a bag and tells him they will head outside, the bandit looking guys get worried as they realize it's finally time. Yusato gets confused but after some hours they reach a cliff, Rose reveals that ahead of him there's a forest called the Darkness of Linger, she then gives him her orders, he can only come home after killing a Grand Grizzly. Yusato tries to refuse it because that's one of the strongest monster, plus he doesn't know how to fight because she only taught him how to run. Yet, Rose gets annoyed and throws him into the forest. The story continues, we see Yusato in mid-air and starts to freak because he's on a free fall to death, he then turns around and casts healing magic to survive the impact. Yet, he refuses to die and turns around again and using his healing magic to land safely. He's relieved that he managed to survive and uses his healing magic again to recover from minor injuries. However, he knows that since he's now inside the forest, he must follow Rose's instructions if he wants to go back home. Therefore, he makes his decision to kill a Grand Grizzly. He claims that's just a 7-foot tall monster, which is nothing to someone who survived hell. Suddenly, that same bear appears behind him, he starts running away from this chasing bear, who was a lot bigger than he thought, but since his training was basically just running he knows he can outrun it. He thinks there's no way a bear can catch up with him but the bear is just behind, he remembers all his training and how he endured that suffering, he thinks the bear is nowhere as scary as Rose and decides to fight it. However, two more bear clubs appear behind the big one, time to hit the hills and outrun all those bears while complaining, he suddenly hears a waterfall nearby and decides to jump inside it. Luckily, he manages to escape those bears and survives, he swims to shore and dries up his clothes, he checks his backpack and sees he only has some rations, a canteen and a knife. He complains about not having anything to start a fire and calls her a demon, he bites the harder than a brick bread and thinks his mission is impossible, but his situation becomes worse when he hears some wolves. He decides to figure out what he will be doing the next day, he marks day on a tree and falls asleep. He's now prepared for the mission and decides to explore the forest, he keeps marking trees to avoid getting lost and thinks that he should know his enemy first. He's trying to find the Grand Grizzly's den and walks through the whole forest, he finally gets some clues when he sees some claw marks on a tree, he thinks that's the Grand Grizzly's claws and it could be nearby. He then suddenly hears some noise from the bushes and pulls out his knife, turns out it's just a rabbit. He gets confused thinking it could be a monster, but the rabbit moves forward and collapses, he notices an injury and asks if the rabbit is injured. Yusato is surprised because the rabbit shakes his head up and down as if he understood him, he then decides to use his healing magic to cure the rabbit and pats him, he hides behind a tree after telling the rabbit to be careful. However, it seems like the rabbit is following him, he tells the rabbit to go away because it will be dangerous but the rabbit refuses to. Yusato keeps walking away but the rabbit keeps chasing him, since the rabbit refuses to stop Yusato asks if he knows where the Grand Grizzly is, the rabbit starts walking to the side and looks back at him. Yusato understands this must mean to follow the rabbit. The rabbit then leads him through the forest, taking Yusato to the Grand Grizzly's den, Yusato decides to observe the bear's behavior without being spotted. According to the book, he read Grand Grizzlies live in groups, which seems to be the case, the rabbit then acts all cute asking for a pat. Another day has passed and Yusato is unsure if he should fill his canteen with untreated water, however, he doesn't have time to think about it. Suddenly, the rabbit appears and jumps onto his shoulder, surprising Yusato, he thought the rabbit went away but he returned. He thinks this is a strange rabbit and tells him they will observe the bears again, there's no change in behavior, the big one is sleeping again but the blue ones are starting to look cute. Yusato also thinks the rabbit is cute and this mission somehow is letting him have some fun. 
However, on the fourth day, Yusato feels some stomach aches, he regrets drinking the river water, especially because healing magic doesn't make it better. He compares it to being poisoned and thinks there must be a way to cure it. The rabbit appears once again, asking for some paths and Yusato forgets for a moment about his pain, he only recovers on the fifth day and the rabbit takes him to a small pond. Yusato understands this water is safer to drink and notices how it looks cleaner than the river. He gives it a try and says that it even tastes better, the rabbit however seems to be scared, Yusato wants to know what's wrong but the rabbit simply starts climbing a tree. Yusato is confused and also climbs the tree, he notices the rabbit looking at an empty place. He thinks the rabbit senses a monster approaching but that's strange because the rabbit wasn't afraid when he saw the grand grizzly. He notices the rabbit shaking in fear but he then hears some noise, he looks carefully and sees a huge white snake, the rabbit starts to shiver and Yusato wonders what kind of monster that snake is, he never saw that monster in his book. The snake is slithering away and Yusato can feel that this is a monster way stronger than a grand grizzly, he feels an intense bloodlust coming from it and promises to never get near it. For the next few days, Yusato was still feeling uneasy but he kept watching the bears, he thinks their behavior has never changed and for some reason he feels calm when looking at them. However, he knows that if he doesn't kill the grand grizzly he cannot go home and with that thought, he decides that tomorrow is the day he must do it. Yet, the next day is filled with rain and the rabbit trying to convince Yusato to not go, Yusato says that he must do it but the rabbit keeps trying to pull his leg. Since the weather is an average day, he decides to wait until the rain stops. After some hours, the rain finally stops and Yusato grows a pear, promising to make mince meat out of the grand grizzly. The rabbit jumps onto his shoulder but there's no way Yusato will be stopped from heading back home, the rabbit feels sad but still lets him go. After reaching the bear den Yusato prepares his knife while the rabbit jumps out of his shoulder, Yusato then walks into the nest but he strangely sees two of the three bears are dead. He wonders what happened and thinks that Rose will kill him because something killed the grand grizzly before him. He looks closely and notices some bite marks, he realizes the one who did it was that huge snake. However, the snake didn't eat them, which means she did it for fun, Yusato then hears some noise coming from some rocks and gets startled. Upon looking closely, he sees the small bear coming out, the little bear tries to wake up its mother to no avail. Upon seeing that, Yusato thinks about how he hates about losing, he never wanted to admit defeat to Rose but his prey was now gone and his resolve resulted in nothing. The little bear starts crying after realizing he won't play with his mother again, and Yusato thinks that he hates to see this stuff the most. He makes up his mind and walks away while promising the small bear that he will take revenge for him, the small bear watches him go, sniffs the floor and goes in another direction. Meanwhile, Kazuki and Susan come to visit Yusato when they are told that he's been training in the forest for the past 10 days. Kazuki thinks that's a bit too long but the big guy reveals they cannot go against her orders. While walking away, Susan tells Kazuki that he seems fired up when it comes to Yusato, he asks if she isn't worried but she replies that despite her worries, they should trust Yusato and Rose. Back in the forest, Yusato is making a spear out of a stick and gets his needed calories, after some stretches he makes up his mind and asks the rabbit to take him to the snake. The rabbit is worried but he tells it to just take him to the snake and leave, the rabbit starts walking and Yusato follows. After a long walk they manage to find the snake, but Yusato sees the little bear trying to fight the snake, upon looking the snake in the eyes, Yusato thinks he's scared but not as scary as Rose. He charges forward surprising the little bear, he tries to throw his level 30 spear but the snake tries to eat his head, he manages to avoid it and stabs its eye. The snake uses its tail to push him against a tree but he uses his heel to recover and get up, he then pulls out his knife and the snake attacks him. Yusato knows he must use the blind spot which is the next eye to attack the snake, he dodges the attack and uses his speed to run toward the snake while it recovers. However, the snake uses its tail to attack him, he dodges it but the smoke cloud allows the snake to bite his arm, he shouts in pain realizing the snake was biting him. He uses his heel to recover from the pain and uses the bitten arm to stab the knife from inside its mouth, the snake gives up and sets him free. However, Yusato starts to feel its poison, he thinks it's not fair but he knows a way to heal himself from his experience with the river water, if his injury is internal he must use his heel to recover internally, with that he recovers and charges again. 
The snake uses the tail to attack him but the small bear decides to help and manages to block it. Yusato then jumps over the bear and lands on top of the snake's head. He then punches the snake with his healing magic to knock it down and follows up by stabbing its eye again with the spear. The snake tries to resist but in the end it gives up and stops moving. Yusato lays on the ground and takes some deep breaths and happy that he managed to do it. However, the little bear is staring at him closely. Yusato realizes that he will now become the little one's lunch. However, the bear treats him gently and Yusato pats it, mentioning that he managed to get revenge for him. He tells the little one that he cannot heal him right now because he uses most of his magic to cure the poison. Yet, suddenly the snake raises again and looks at them. Yusato cannot move and the little one tries to carry him away. However, our boy is heavy. He orders the bear to run away but the snake lunges to attack them. Yusato realizes this is the end and starts cursing Rose. He blames everything on her and calls her an ogre. Suddenly, Rose appears from the air and kicks the snake down. She starts cursing the snake, saying that it should have died when Yusato was fighting. Both Yusato and the little one are shocked. Yusato asks what she's doing here and she reveals the rabbit called her. Yusato is confused but she explains that the rabbit is her pet Kakuru, who she told to watch over Yusato. Yusato doesn't believe it because the rabbit was injured when they met each other. Rose then reveals it was all a scam to gain his trust. Rose then explains she was always nearby just in case, but she didn't expect the snake to appear in the forest. Yusato asks what this is and she explains it's a monster modified by the Demon Lord's army. In fact, Sigils wasn't able to defeat the snake in the last Demon Lord's invasion, she doesn't know how the snake managed to beat the Grand Grizzly, especially because the kingdom's elite force can't do it. Yusato thinks she's a monster because she told him to do that, Rose reveals she never expected him to win that fight, she just wanted him to get experience. However, things got interesting and she wanted to see what he would do, he complains that he almost died and the little bear also comes to defend Yusato. Rose notices the little one like Yusato making him think that the bear lost his parents and is lonely, he pats the bear and the two act friendly. Rose compliments Yusato and tells the bear he will be coming with them but he has to carry Yusato, the bear takes Yusato on his back and Rose grabs the two with one hand and carries them back. She tells Yusato that he passed this exam and now he has the right, he gets confused but she reveals that despite lacking training, he has to right to stand next to her on the battlefield. She says that he has everything a body that can withstand pain, physical prowess and more importantly, an indomitable spirit that's something that the other healers and her squad lack. She tells him to be proud and they might still make it back in time, Yusato is confused but she reveals the demon lord's army is preparing to attack. The story continues, we see the demon lord asks a subordinate Amila about their plan to invade the Linger Kingdom, she confirms that everything is on track and they're all prepared to advance soon. The demon lord is relieved and states that she will be the one commanding their army, he mentions they failed their last invasion and warns her that she should give her all while also avoiding death, she gives him some hope and he dismisses her. While walking back, another guy noticed Amila was nervous while having the audience with the demon lord, she tells him to do his job instead of teasing her and calls him monster Dr. Hirolook. The guy claims his name is already cute and replies that his job is going pretty great after all, he managed to complete a new demon modified monster prototype, he asks if she wants to see it and she follows him. She then sees a huge snake similar to the one Yusato fought before. The demon is hyped out about this monster and reveals its name, Amila however, mentions that's the same name he used on his last prototype that went missing during their attempt to invade Linger. The guy complains his snake was beaten up by Siglis and it ran away. However, this new monster is way stronger, still Amila couldn't care less because she knows there's someone in Linger who's stronger than Siglis. The guy gets curious and asks if she's talking about the kidnappers, she confirms mentioning they never fight but they're still on the battlefield carrying the wounded back to the rear at some insane speed. The guy thinks they minimize casualties but Amila explains the kidnappers boss is a healer who not only has insane healing skills but is also an excellent fighter. That person is Rose the strongest person in Linger, Amila deeply hates Rose because Rose fought her master. Yet. The guy didn't stay alive to tell what happened, this monster tells her to calm down because she cannot fight during their invasion because she must command the army. Yet, Amila walks away mentioning she will leave the fight to their immortal dark magic user named Black Knight. Back to Yusato, he's happy because he missed his bed to the point where he also enjoys Tom's snores, yet he must wake up and do his stuff, he gives some fruits to the little bear for breakfast and notices Rose's rabbit nearby. However, Yusato tells him that he cannot forgive him for taking advantage of his innocence, the rabbit acts cute and Yusato almost falls for it. Yet, 
He tries to refuse to be nice to the rabbit, but he cannot resist it. He keeps giving the bear more fruits and calls it Blurin. Rose arrives repeating the same name and she asks if that's its name. Yusato confirms it, mentioning he combined the words Blue Grizzly. Rose is shocked to hear that but focuses on saying that she told the king about the bear and it will now be the property of the rescue squad. Yusato is confused about that and she reveals that the bear must also do his duty if he wants to stay here. The little one is scared with her smile and hides, turns out that from now on Yusato must not only run with weights, but also carry the bear. Rose explains this will be a regime close to what will happen on the battlefield, she tells him to think of the bear as someone who needs rescue, she orders him to start running and he follows her orders. In fact, Yusato only considers this as a training with more weight than usual, he thinks that all he needs to do is to control his healing magic properly. Yet, Rose shouts that he's too slow and the wounded will die, Yusato complains but picks up the pace. Suddenly, Tom comes out of a bush and tries to punch him but Yusato avoids it, another guy comes running into him, but he also dodges, he thinks they're crazy and asks what they're doing. The thugs chase him and explain this is a simulation of what will happen on the battlefield, Yusato tries to run faster but the thugs yell others are hiding too. Yet, Yusato speeds up and keeps running for the next hour, the others throw some sticky water balloons from trees, forcing Yusato to run while holding his breath, some appear from the ground with wooden swords and try to hit him but he dodges. After three hours of running, another guy cuts a rope to make Yusato play Donkey Kong, but in the fourth hour Yusato finally uses his magic but feels strange. The rabbit comes out from a bush and smiles, yet Yusato panics and jumps over him thinking the rabbit is doing it again. With time, Yusato feels even stranger and finally collapses without knowing why, Yusato is confused because he should at least be able to last for half a day. Rose appears, explaining that will be his stamina on the battlefield, Yusato is confused but she explains the human body also gets fatigue from feelings like anxiety, fear and frustration. That's the reason why he ran out of energy faster than normal, Yusato asks what he can do but she heals him up and tells him to get used to those emotions. She says he must build up his mental fortitude and situational awareness, she then walks away and orders him to run through the town and around the castle during the afternoon. Yusato is confused but follows those orders, yet every citizen is shocked to see a guy running in the streets with the blue grizzly on his back, Yusato already knew this would happen despite Blurin being a well-behaved monster. Suddenly, the people start smiling as they realize that Yusato is also part of the rescue squad. Suddenly Blurin smells something and wakes up the bear points forward and Yusato stops the buy fruit stall, he doesn't have any money but asks the name of those fruits and the old lady calls it Peffles. Yusato then asks her why the people aren't freaking out while he carries a monster on his back, the lady replies it's because he's part of the rescue squad, she talks about his uniform and reveals the gang also runs through the city all the time. Yusato thinks about it and confirms someone would get used to it after seeing those scary bandits running around, before he leaves the lady gives him a peffles and blurring eats it. As Yusato runs away, a little girl asks the old lady if he belongs to the rescue squad, the lady confirms and asks why she wants to know, the girl simply dismisses it and looks at him. Yusato then plans to make a quick stop by the castle to visit Susan and Kazuki. However, a guy notices him pass by and starts running after him, the guy chases him while asking Yusato to stop but he keeps getting behind, Yusato only notices when the guy collapses on the floor and asks if he's okay. Yusato heals the guy and asks what he wants, the guy reveals he wanted to say hi because he also is part of the rescue squad, Yusato is confused but the guy introduces himself as Orga Fleur, one of the other two healers. After hearing the whole story, Fleur is impressed to know that Yusato was summoned by mistake along with the heroes, Yusato claims he almost forgot about it because he's been training hard every day. Fleur thinks Yusato is amazing for being able to keep up with Rose's training because he and his sister couldn't, Yusato asks if she's the other healer. Fleur confirms, mentioning she's five years younger and they run a clinic in the castle town to heal people with magic. Yet, Yusato is confused about why Fleur collapsed just now, Fleur explains he's not good at using healing magic on himself, he can only do it to heal others, Yusato is surprised there are other types of healers and Fleur confirms, mentioning they're all part of the rescue squad, therefore when it's needed they help their captain and heal everyone. Upon hearing those words, Yusato remembers when Rose told him that he would go to the front lines and heal the injured by her side, he gets worried and asks Fleur what their roles on the battlefield are. Fleur replies the bandits retrieve the injured from the front lines, while he and his sister heal them. 
In short, they're the rear support, yet Yusato reveals that he will be going to the front lines with Rose, Fleur is shocked and Yusato questions if someone like him can do it. Fleur replies the ones in most danger are the heroes and the knights, and if they get injured they will most likely die, but if they have healers on the front lines, it means those people can be saved, he reveals that's a tough and dangerous job. However, he knows Rose would never bring someone who she didn't completely trust, Yusato thinks about his friends and gets worried, Fleur then gets up to return to the clinic and Yusato decides to continue his training. Before departing, Fleur asks Yusato to not hate Rose because she doesn't know how to measure her words. Yet, Yusato tells Fleur to not worry because he never hated her, in fact he also has some words to tell her. Yusato then starts running and Fleur feels relieved that Rose finally met the person she was looking for. Suddenly, Fleur's sister comes to complain asking if he has a death wish for wandering around, he tells her that he's not that frail but her look tells us otherwise. He then tells her that he just met someone interesting and she gets curious about that person, yet Fleur replies she will eventually meet and like him. Meanwhile, Yusato reaches the castle and asks for permission to enter with the bear, the guard allows him confusing Yusato, who asks how he can bring a monster to the castle, the guy replies that Rose has signed it off, so he should go ahead. Upon reaching the training grounds, Yusato watches Susan practicing against three soldiers, she gets distracted when she sees it and asks about the bear. They take a break and Yusato tells her everything about surviving in the forest filled with monsters. Yet she's way more excited to pet Blurin, Yusato tells her to go ahead but Blurin slaps her hand away, refusing her pat. Yusato apologizes, saying Blurin is shy but she is even more excited, she asks Blurin to become her friend but he bites her hand when she tries to pat him. Yusato says this could mean Blur and thinks she's a bad person but he then bites his hand too, she teases him but they eventually let it go. Yusato then notices the injuries on her hand and she claims it's because she's training seriously, he then holds her hand and heals it surprising her with his amazing skill. The girl thinks he came all the way here to visit her and blushes, but Yusato confirms he came here to visit her and Kazuki, she feels rejected and reveals Kazuki left the kingdom with Siglis to get some combat experience against monsters. While walking, Kazuki asks Siglis if it's true that the Demon Lord's army will start invading soon, Siglis confirms it mentioning it will probably have a much stronger army than last time, and that's why they summon Susan and Kazuki, heroes who can boost their soldiers' morale. Yet Kazuki is still unsure and hesitates still he promises to give his all but they all stop because there's a pack of hung wolves in front of them, they prepare to battle and Kazuki makes his resolve. Yusato is impressed but wonders if Kazuki will be okay, Susan replies it will only last some days but once he returns, she will be the one performing that training. Yusato teases her mentioning, she will probably enjoy every moment of becoming OP in another world, yet she complains because he's not worried about her at all. After the conversation, Yusato decides to continue his training, he thinks about the other two doing their best for the incoming battle and that they're going to fight. And if they do it, he also wants to somehow help and not be the one staying behind to be protected, he thinks that in his previous world, he only wished to do the things he couldn't, however this is not who he is anymore. After returning home and putting Blurin to sleep then Yusato meets Rose, she asks if his body has already gotten used to the training and he answers he got a bit used to it, yet he wants to train more, upon hearing those words Rose tells him to continue and walks away. Yusato stops her to ask about her words to steal himself, he explains that he freaked up after almost dying to the snake and then heard about the incoming invasion. He initially thought he didn't want to be a part of this, yet today he changed his mind, he won't fight or kill enemies, however he will do anything to save everyone because he's a member of the rescue squad. Rose smiles for the first time and bump her fist into his chest, telling him to have pride in saving people and the values of their squad. Upon hearing those words, Yusato smiles and calls her captain. However, the next day Rose wakes up by putting a heavy back on top of him and tell him the king ordered him to join Susan's training. The story continues, we see Yusato asks Rose why he must join Susan's training because Kazuki went with Siglis, Rose explains he was supposed to join Kazuki's training as well. However, she refused because he had just returned from the forest. The king later sent another request to which she couldn't refuse again. She tries to calm him down by mentioning he's only going to act as a healer, if needed, she advises him to simply play his part for the next three days and return home. They finally arrive at the meeting point and Susan is happy that Yusato will be joining her, she thinks he only brought Blurin with him to help them bond with each other. Yet, 
Yusato explains he only brought Blurin because he hates everyone else, she starts complaining about his lack of empathy and never playing along with her random BS, she then introduces the rest of her group, Oruku the Knight and Korin the Mage. Before leaving, Rose tells Susan to not be reckless because Yusato can only heal wounds and cure poison, if someone dies, they will stay dead. Susan takes the advice to heart and Rose thinks she will be fine since she was trained by Siglis, she then turns to Yusato and reveals she has no advice for him. He's confused and she approaches him asking if he has a problem with it, Yusato replies he's good and she gets going. Yet he's suddenly surprised when Susan talks about how strong Rose is, yet she refuses to explain it when asked about it and starts moving. Meanwhile, at the castle the princess gets worried about Kazuki and asks what he's doing, he explains that he's training his sword skills, but she mentions that he just arrived the day before and was supposed to rest. He dismisses it, explaining he had a great night of sleep and can handle training again, she thinks he's pushing himself too much but he flexes his muscles to show off he's fine. The princess realizes she's holding his arm and gets shy before walking away. Back at Yusato's group, Susan recounts Kazuki's experience while training, Yusato didn't expect Kazuki to be so worn out, but he had told Susan the experience was worth it. He battled tons of monsters inside the darkness of Linger, and Susan reveals that's where they're heading to right now. Upon hearing that name, Yusato reminds the time he was observing Blurin and his family, he wonders if Blurin misses his home but that moment is interrupted by Susan asking if the little bear will wake up soon. She thinks this is the perfect chance to pet the bear since he won't bite her, she tries to do it but Yusato slaps her hand, she initially gets confused but tries to pet the bear several other times, all denied by Yusato's slaps. She finally asks what is he doing that but he replies with the same question, she uses this chance to flirt with him, mentioning he's smacking her hand and talking her down. She thinks he became a sadist but he has no idea of what she's saying. Blurin then wakes up and Yusato tells him to walk by himself, but the bear can barely walk straight because he's sleepy. Susan thinks this is her chance, she tells Blurin to hop on her back and she will carry him, Yusato tries to stop her from doing it, but Blurin lies on her back, Susan is happy that she finally touched Blurin's fluffy fur and tries to get up. However, she falls flat on her face because the bear is too heavy, Yusato helps her out and they continue walking as he tells her to not get hurt outside of battle. She thanks him for healing her, but they're forced to stop because the mage senses multiple presences ahead of them, the knight warns them to be prepared to fight monsters. However the mage notices he's wrong, some bandits appear from the bushes as they cannot ambush anyone who already knows about their presence. The bandits do their usual stuff, threatening them to hand over their goods or else, the knight refuses to making the bandits mention how big their group is. Yusato is confused about what the plot is going on, because these guys aren't intimidating at all. He notices Susan pulling his shirt and he tries to be a Chad and reassure her that everything is fine. Still, this crazy girl is excited to see real bandits mentioning that she has never seen one before. Yusato thinks this girl is clearly out of her mind, but Blurin who was at the back appears by Yusato's side. The bandits start to panic because they never expected someone to tame a blue grizzly. However, one of them tells the others to take a better look because that's just a cub, the rest of the bandits think this is their chance to get a bear and skin it. Yusato gets mad at those words, but Susan attacks the bandits before he can do anything else, Yusato is impressed that she managed to control her power to simply knock the bandit out with lightning. She explains she practiced a lot to make it perfect, and Yusato incentivizes her to go wild. The bandits decide to charge forward, thinking that Susan cannot use her magic, if they get close, yet Susan electrocutes them while they run. Yusato is acting like a cheerleader while also calling Susan a human stun gun and a human electric eel, suddenly the mage senses something new. Seconds later, a horde of fall boars pass by them, the knight is confused because these monsters should live deep in the forest. The boards almost hit Yusato from the back but Blurin head butts them, Susan tries to electrocute the rest, but another boar dashes toward her. Yusato tries to protect her but they get hit and are both projected into the air. They start falling deep into the forest, but Yusato uses his body to protect her from the fall, he casts healing magic while taking the heavy hits from the tree branches, but they still end up falling into the nearby river. After returning to the water surface, Yusato realizes that's the same river he fell when he came to the forest, he knows there's a waterfall ahead and tells Susan to take a deep breath. After falling, Susan tries to wake him up and carries him to the shore while mentioning that she will pay this debt. Yusato then wakes up mentioning he's fine and that this is quite embarrassing. She gets all shy and pushes him away after realizing that he woke up. Yusato then uses his magic to heal her wounds, 
but Susan apologizes for putting him in this situation. He dismisses it, mentioning that he's glad that they at least got into this together. He looks around saying he never expected to return so soon. He then explains that Rose dumped him here to train before, and that this forest is filled with monsters far stronger than those boars. Yusato then sits down to check their gear and decide how to move from now on. Susan asks if it's not better to escape the forest because of the monsters. Yusato reveals it's about to get dark and it might rain, therefore it's better to find a spot to camp and move tomorrow. She asks if he knows about any safe spot. He replies that he slept on a tree branch and asks if she's fine with it. Susan mentions she never climbed a tree because she was never allowed to despite wanting it. Yusato thinks she came from a wealthy family who sheltered her entire life. Yusato then finds a cave and decides to camp there, mentioning that not only it will cover them from rain, but it's also better than going deeper into the forest. He then advises her to get out of her wet clothes and she shyly tells him to not peek. After noticing Yusato's stupid face, she realizes that he never thought about it. Yusato then decides to use Susan's lighting abilities to fish and start a fire. He's quite happy about all of this because he didn't have a fire the last time. However, he notices Susan on the corner. He apologizes for this awkward situation but she's more into checking all his muscles from afar. She suddenly looks up and sees some monsters. She gets excited and Yusato calls them venom monkeys, explaining that he read about them. The monkeys get down and he tells her the monkeys are friendly, but she can get poisoned if she touches them. Yet, Susan is already touching one, Yusato asks what the plot is she doing, but she replies that she has already been poisoned by the monkey's cuteness. She tells him there's nothing to fear but the small monkey bites her finger, she collapses forcing Yusato to cure her. Meanwhile, at the palace the king gets informed by the mages familiar that Yusato and Susan are missing, Kazuki wants to know more about it and the king explains all the information he currently has. The king reveals he didn't want to reveal this to Kazuki but the princess forced him to do, Kazuki asks if they already sent a research party but the king reveals they will depart tomorrow. Kazuki thinks that's too late and decides to head out by himself right now. However, big gorilla mommy Rose appears and tells him to stop, she tells him to not worry because Yusato is with Suzun, she bluntly explains that Yusato won't die so easily, so if Yusato is fine Suzun should be safe, Kazuki is shocked to hear that. After all, Yusato is a random dude who came here by mistake and got healing magic. Talking about the devil, Yusato is having an amazing time thinking it's way easier to survive in the forest with Susan by his side, she gets annoyed because he's literally calling her camping equipment, but he dismisses it. She lets it pass and since he notices that she's tired, he decides they should sleep in turn starting by her. She rejects it, mentioning that he should sleep first because he used his healing magic on her, he accepts the deal and lies down. While awake, Susan looks at Yusato and asks if he's asleep, he reveals he's still awake and she asks how he feels about being summoned to this world. She asks if he thinks about ever returning home, Yusato explains that's a tough question because he does want to go home. Yet, he also has a reason to stay in this world, Susan then reveals she doesn't want to go back, but is surprised that he didn't ask why, he asks her if he should do it and she confirms. He reveals that he knows why she doesn't want to go back, it's because she likes this world more than theirs. Susan confirms, explaining there's nothing left for her in their world, she's willing to throw away her family, friends, or who she was before just to stay here, she reveals that she was waiting her entire life for this moment, she calls it a chance to free herself. She feels she's finally free because she has nothing to tie her down in this world. I guess she forgot she's one of the heroes. Yet, she's surprised to hear Yusato say that sounds good to him, he doesn't understand her expression and she asks if he's not disappointed by who she really is. Yusato explains he always wanted to change and stop being an ordinary guy who is passive, therefore he doesn't think they're different from each other. Susan is impressed, but Yusato continues, when they arrived he didn't want to hold them back and that's why he always accepted Rose's training, but now he's determined to protect her, Kazuki and everyone else in this kingdom as a member of the rescue squad. When asked about it, Susan replies she also wants to protect this place as a hero. Upon confirming their resolve, Yusato says they will save the kingdom together and forget their old world. Susan smiles mentioning that Yusato has grown a lot since coming here, Yusato also reveals that he feels closer to her. In their world, he always thought about her as a flawless perfect girl, yet Susan is shocked because he never treated her as if she was a perfect girl, but she reveals that she doesn't mind it because she'd rather be close to him than be admired from afar. 
After blushing, Yusato decides to hide his face by going to sleep. The next day, they walk through the forest and Yusato tells her to be careful. They hear some noise and prepare for a fight, but turns out to be Blurin, who quickly jumps on top of Yusato. The night dude appears out of breath and collapses. After recovering, he explains they've been searching for them, but Blurin suddenly started to run away. They followed him thinking the bear would lead to them and here they are. Susan tells Blurin, he did a good job, but the bear is smelling something and walks in a certain direction. He stops at a place and Susan asks where they are. Yusato explains, this was Blurin home before his parents were killed by a giant snake. Yusato feels sad for the little bear, but Blurin comes to him making them confused. Yusato thinks Blurin wants to go and Susan is impressed. The bear already made his decision. She explains that Blurin knows that he belongs by Yusato's side. Blurin starts walking away and Susan tells Yusato it's time to return home. The story continues, we see after returning, the king welcomes Yusato and Susan back. Susan apologizes for worrying him, but he claims he's the one who must apologize for putting Yusato into this. Yusato dismisses it and confuses the king by mentioning that he's already used to these types of situations. Our boy quickly realizes he made a mistake and looks at Rose, he tries to explain himself and lies by saying that he used to explore the woods in their previous world. The king believes it and decides to ask about his training with the rescue squad, Yusato looks at Rose again, thinking that's hard to answer, yet he claims that it's way too easy. The king is happy to hear it but Rose smirks at Yusato, he starts to panic and realizes that's what she wants him to answer, he realizes that his mind has been pressured by Rose and feels frustrated. Yet the king announces that Susan's training will be modified and asks her to rest for the day. The two are dismissed but Rose and Sigleys are asked to stay behind. Yusato is confused but he's forced to leave. Susan asks if something is wrong and he replies that he's wondering about the subject they're talking about because the minister seemed worried. Susan confirms and Yusato worries that he might get fired. She laughs it out and suddenly stops after hearing Kazuki's voice. Kazuki immediately complains about Yusato being too casual after being attacked by monsters and going missing, Yusato apologizes, and the princess explains that Kazuki wanted to look for them. Susan calls him reckless, but Yusato mentions she's the same after being bitten by a poisonous monkey, Kazuki is confused and Yusato tries to explain, but Susan stops him. They head outside and Kazuki reveals Rose's claims that there was no need to worry because Yusato was with Susan. He mentions those words calmed him down but Yusato knows that Rose was thinking that he was having an uneasy mode when compared to training. Kazuki is impressed because Rose completely trusts Yusato, yet Yusato thinks that Kazuki is just a pure and innocent guy, he places his hand on his shoulder asking him to never change. After all, only he and Susan need to be corrupted, Kazuki doesn't understand it but accepts the deal. Susan however, starts to complain because he just called her tainted. Later, Yusato and Susan leave and the princess mentions how close they look together, Kazuki confirms mentioning they are getting pretty close lately. Yet the princess corrects him mentioning they're close to him, she mentions how he was enjoying himself while hanging with them, Kazuki dismisses it by mentioning they were friends before. The princess gets worried and asks if she can also be Kazuki's friend, she mentions that Susan treats her informally but Kazuki never calls her by her name. Upon noticing his surprised reaction, the princess apologizes and tells him to not force himself. Kazuki then grows a pair and promises to call her Celia from now on. Meanwhile, in the throne room, the king reveals he interrogated the bandits who attacked Yusato's group. In short, the bandits were crossing the plains and noticed fewer monsters than usual, and that's when they were attacked by a herd of fall boars in the forest. The king thinks the monsters must be fleeing the plains for the forest, and that can only mean the monsters are running away from something that is coming towards the kingdom. Siglis thinks it's the demon lord's army and the king confirms it, Siglis then mentions the demon lord underestimated them in their previous battle, but the same won't happen again. He believes the demon lord will use everything available to capture their kingdom. The king confirms and asks him to tell all commanding officers to be prepared to mobilize the troops at any time, Siglis confirms and starts walking away. The king then decides to talk to Rose in private, he apologizes for the wait and reveals that he must ask her for something. He explains that he normally cannot assign this mission to the captain of the rescue squad, but Rose replies that he doesn't need to worry about it. She knows he wants her to scout and locate the location of the demon lord's army, the king confirms and apologizes for the request. 
She dismisses the apology because she knows she's the fastest person in the kingdom, she prepares to leave, but the king reveals he has something else to talk about. He steps down from his throne and asks if she wants to return to her position as the battalion commander, yet Rose refuses to, mentioning that she bears more guilt than he thinks she does. The king thinks she's too hard on herself and mentions she was the first healer to ever be appointed as a battalion commander. However, Rose replies that it's simply the truth, he asks if she has ever forgiven herself and she denies it. Her eyes become filled with rage as she asks how she could ever forget it. She was forced to accept the deaths of all her subordinates, and the fact that she couldn't revive them and the scar on her eye will never enable her to forget them. The king tries to convince her that she shouldn't bear this burden, but she replies that it's something she must do, her subordinates only died because she was full of herself. However, that made her realize that it's all over when someone is dead, no matter how skilled or trustworthy they are, and that scar is a punishment that will never let her forget about her sins. She reveals that was the origin of her decision to create the rescue squad, they don't fight they save lives, the king confirms by stating they saved many men during the battle two years ago. He asks her if she hasn't reached her goal but Rose reveals there's another reason why the squad exists. The king is curious and asks what's the reason, Rose reveals that her ultimate goal is to find a subordinate who will not die, the king feels stupid because that's something impossible. Yet Rose explains that's the reason for her hellish training, she's been looking for someone who can use healing magic, someone who's determined to push past his physical limits, and someone with the determination to never give up. She's been looking for someone who has all of these traits, the king realizes Yusato is just like that, Rose confirms mentioning he's everything she's been looking for. He has insane survival instincts, adaptability, and the will to survive, she mentions that his best trait is that he hates to lose, and his worst one is that he can be easily influenced. Yet, no matter what she does, he still gets back up and stands up to her, she knows he will never give up and reminds him of the guy she lost. She reveals that she's determined to make him the strongest healer, she realizes that she spoke too much and apologizes. She decides to focus on the mission instead, and the king puts his confidence on her. Later at night, Yusato finds a letter and asks about it, the squad member explains Rose left it for him before leaving, Yusato thinks this is bad news and sits down to open it. He finds out that he doesn't need to train the next day and that he should deliver another letter to someone. Yusato then asks where Rose went but nobody knows, she simply told them that she was going out and wouldn't return for dinner. Elsewhere, the Demon Lord's army is trying to make a bridge to cross the river, the Black Knight sighs making the commander question what's wrong. The Black Knight thinks it's quite annoying to see the commander's excitement about all of this. The commander gets angry, complaining that this isn't the way to talk to his superior, but the Black Knight bluntly apologizes, mentioning they're literally the same rank. The commander mentions she doesn't care because she's the one in charge and the Black Knight should follow orders. The Black Knight apologizes and walks away, asking to be informed when the bridge is completed. For Eyes Weirdo mentions how the commander is struggling, but tells him to do something, he tells her that he's giving moral support and that the bridge construction is going fine. The commander confirms it and mentions that in a few hours they will start their invasion. Yet suddenly someone mentions there is someone on the other side of the river, she thinks it's just a scout and couldn't care less because it will be too late to return to the kingdom and inform what's going on. Suddenly a tree is thrown into the bridge that is being constructed. It completely destroys it, shocking the commander who doesn't understand what's going on, but upon looking closely, she notices Rose standing on the other side and shouts her name. Rose smiles, thinking she was supposed to only scout but she managed to delay the invasion by some days. The next day, Yusato follows Rose's map to deliver the letter, yet he notices everyone is looking and commenting about him, he doesn't understand why because he didn't bring Bluren with him, but everyone is confused about why is Yusato walking instead of running. He then meets the old lady who asks where Bluren is and if he wants to buy some fruits, Yusato confirms it and mentions that he will be picking it up on his way back. He finally manages to find the place on the map and steps inside, a girl comes to greet him and upon noticing his clothes, asks if he's the person who just joined the rescue squad. Yusato confirms but she interrupts him by mentioning that her brother already told her his name, yet every time she tries she guesses it wrong. Yusato tells her his name and she then introduces herself as Yururu Fleur Orga's sister, she then welcomes him to their clinic and Yusato asks where is Orga? She reveals he's inside examining a patient and convinces him to peek inside, Yusato doesn't know if they should be doing it but she reveals that Organ needs to concentrate. They watch Orga use his healing magic on a kid, and Yusato notices that his healing magic color is intense and smooth, which is the exact opposite of his. 
Orga finishes healing the kid, who gets up and tells his mother that he doesn't feel sick anymore. The mother thanks Orga, but the kid asks him why people are watching. Upon noticing it's Yusato, Orga ends the deal and they talk. Orga thanks him for delivering Rose's letter, but Yusato dismisses it, mentioning that he always wanted to visit the clinic. Yururu then asks how everyone in the squad is doing, he confirms it's always the same thing and she laughs it out, mentioning how she misses them. Orga starts reading the letter, while Yurura tells Yusato that she and her brother couldn't keep up with the training, she still feels bad because Rose has put everything into training them, but things didn't work out. Everyone was initially excited but the training was so hard that they became afraid of Rose, she mentions that Rose was desperate at that time. Yusato is confused by those words, but Yururu explains that Rose seems much happier right now, he thinks that's only because she managed to find a new punching bag. Suddenly, someone comes into the clinic to ask for Orga's help because someone fell from a roof while fixing it and injured two other people, Yusato joins the siblings and they reach the location. Orga thinks they need to treat them urgently and asks Yusato to take care of someone. They quickly rush to their patients and Yusato teats a guy with a broken bleeding leg, he thinks that he only healed basic injuries on himself, Orga and Susan before. However, if war breaks out, he will have to treat injuries more severe than this in the middle of the battle, he knows that he trained for that moment, yet he's still unsure. Orga notices this and tells him to calm down, he explains it doesn't matter who or where he's treating because he has the power to heal them. He tells Yusato that he believes in him and Yusato remembers Kazuki mentioning that Rose believes in him, he finally makes up his mind and decides to believe in himself, he focuses on his magic and quickly heals the leg of the injured guy. While returning to the clinic Orga thanks him for helping, but Yusato is unsure if he did a good job. Yururu confirms it, mentioning the patient was surprised to not feel more pain, Orga uses this chance to ask Yusato to drop by the clinic when he has time and help them, Yusato takes the offer and decides to leave. While saying goodbye, Yururu mentions that Orga looked cool while advising Yusato, he then reveals that Rose's letter is a summoning for them to join the war against the Demon Lord's army. He then explains that Yusato doesn't have any real experience and can only rely on his abilities, Yururu realizes the war is about to start and feels sad. Meanwhile, Yusato manages to get the fruit from the old lady when he's suddenly stopped by a girl with fox ears, he's confused and asks if she's lost. She replies that he's the only one who can see it and the only person who can change the future, he notices the girl's eyes changing colors and starts watching images of the war. In those images, the demon lord's army is winning, he then sees Susan and Kazuki losing their lives to the Black Knight. Yusato returns to reality completely shocked, and the girl replies that he must repay her in the future. The story continues, we see Yusato chases after the little girl as he determined to question her about why he saw the death of his friends. The girl watches him nearby and thinks about how Yusato is the only one that can change the future, Yusato questions a guard if he has seen the little fox girl but he hasn't. Rose arrives to scare the guy away, so Yusato pities him for being terrified by Rose, Yusato can understand him though as Rose manhandles him. She wants to hear more about how scary she is, but Yusato manages to change the conversation and to where she has been. Rose reveals that she destroyed her bridge that the demon army was trying to make while she was scouting. Yusato has a serious smart mouth as he points out that she did a lot more than just some scouting but this just got some manhandled again. Rose explains that she has seen the fox girl before and she appeared there two years ago. The fox girl is only 12 years old but she somehow managed to evade bandits and kidnappers to arrive at the capital. Demi-humans like her are extremely valuable to bandits, since they are prized for their physical appearance, more importantly some even have an aptitude for rare magic. Yusato wonders if this rare magic is able to show people visions of the future that they hope never happen, Rose reveals that there are rumors of beast men who can use magic called precognition. They are extremely rare and even if they existed they would be well guarded back in the beast lands, Rose probes further about why he wants to know but Yusato pretends that he was just wondering about the beast people since he read about them in a book. That night, the king thanks Rose for buying them some time but she points out that the demon army will likely be building another bridge soon. It will only take a couple of days to finish, so the king decides to inform the soldiers and citizens about the invasion. He will do it tomorrow, but he wants to speak with Susan and Kazuki before the night is over. On their way to see the King Kazuki and Susan run into Celia, Kazuki has a pretty awkward interaction with her and after exchanging pleasantries, they part ways. Suzanne wonders what happened between them but Kazuki says it was nothing. Elsewhere, Yusato finds that he can't fall asleep, he can't stop thinking about the vision and how if it is the future, there is nothing he can do about it. 
However, he remembers that the fox girl told him that he's actually the only one that can change this future. Just then Yasato spots something outside and it turned out to be Kazuki. The two talk about how much they have been training and Kazuki reveals that they just spoke with the king. They were told that the battle with the demon lord's army will soon begin, but they both already knew that. However, when Kazuki pictured himself fighting he couldn't fall asleep and he admits that he ran away from the castle to come here and reveals that he is scared to fight. It's not just now, he was even scared when he fought monsters for the first time, his legs froze up and he only managed to fight at the last second. It was only when the fight ended that he realized just how lightly he has been taking everything. He can see things more clearly now and realizes that the Demon Lord's army will do everything they can to kill him, he is terrified of this but he is under extreme pressure because everyone is counting on him. Yusato breaks the tension by telling Kazuki how cool he is, Yusato always thought that he never got scared but he realizes now that that is not the case. The expectations of those around Kazuki have been an immense burden, Yusato points out that Kazuki doesn't actually have to live up to those expectations and sometimes he can put himself first. As for Yusato though, he confidently explains that he will be going to battle, he wants to save those who will fight the Demon Lord's army. Yusato is of course scared as well, but he has already made his decision. Kazuki reminds Yusato that he was just dragged into this by accident and now he can even die. Yusato admits that he was brought by accident but a lot has happened since then, there have been tough times but he has also met a lot of people that have showed him the way, he wants to help them and that includes Kazuki. Yusato points out that even if Kazuki doesn't fight, they will be friends either way, these words turn out to be just what Kazuki needed to hear. Kazuki snaps himself out of depression and declares that he will fight to protect Yusato and Suzun, he isn't sure if he can fight as a hero but he definitely knows that he wants to help his friends. Kazuki refuses to just watch and proclaims that he will take his fear and fight in spite of it, having his friends by his side reassures him more than anything, so they agree to protect everyone together. Yusato realizes that he just said a bunch of corny stuff but Kazuki assures him that it's exactly what he needed to hear. Afterwards, Yusato hopes to forget his corny speech with some sleep but Susan appears to laugh at their bromance, Yusato says that he's too tired to deal with her mockery but she goes on to mock him even more. Yusato knows that she followed Kazuki because she could tell that something was wrong, but she is glad to see that Yusato took care of it. Yusato admits that there is a part of him that doesn't want to fight, and Susan wonders if he doesn't want her to fight either. Yusato would rather she not, but he knows that she has already decided to live in this world, this is true so she leaves as they all have a big day tomorrow. The next day, the king makes his announcement, it's only a matter of time before the demon lord army invasion, so he plans to intercept them in the grasslands. Two years ago they pushed back the Demon Lord's army but he is sure that they have gotten stronger since then, it won't be easy but he reminds everyone that they have gotten stronger as well. He points out that they have two heroes now and Kazuki and Suzun, they also have the help of the rescue squad, who play a critical role on the battlefield, the king concludes his speech by assuring them that they will win and everyone gets hyped. Later, Kazuki goes to see Celia, he apologizes for coming unannounced but she is actually glad. He confirms that there will be going into battle, so she prays for his safety. He swears to protect the country but more importantly, he promises to come back to see her, this shock Celia hopes he will and the two say goodbye. Elsewhere, we see Ruru fans over Blurin, Yusato lets her pet him but warns her Blurin might not allow it, Ruru is certain that they will be the best of friends but she is severely mistaken as Blurin slaps her hand away. Blurin keeps slapping her away, so she's glad to see that a little bunny has appeared to make her feel better. This girl just can't catch a break though, as Kakura teams up with Blurin to push her away. Yusato must then keep Orga from crushing himself to death and they watch as Yururu continues to try and pet Blurin, Orga reveals that she's actually really nervous since it's her first time in battle, her erratic behavior is just her way of hiding her anxiety. Yusato then called to go see Rose, but he just now realizes that he has never been to her room before. Yusato fears that she has decided to torture him but he arrives to find that she just wants to talk. She wants to saddle to explain his role on the battlefield, so he says that it's to heal the injured with her on the front lines, that is only partly correct as the beginning of the battle will be different. The other squad members will bring the wounded back to the rear and they will treat them there along with Orga and Yururu. There won't be many wounded on the front lines at the start, so they would just be sitting ducks there. Furthermore, Rose tells them not to heal the wrong people on the front lines, Yusato out thinks that she means not to heal the enemy but she calls him an idiot as that's not what she means. 
there will be people that are injured but still fighting, he shouldn't try to heal these people since he will just get in their way, it will be up to Yusato to use his judgment to decide who to heal at a moment's notice. Yusato completely understands and Rose finally gives him his rescue squad uniform, it was designed this way because it was made to help them stand out on the battlefield. Our protagonist Yusato couldn't be happier so she tells him to put it on, Rose is glad he put on so much muscle, since Yusato was able to fill the suit up well because of it. Rose manhandles him once more to explain that healers are not immortal, once they die it's over. The one thing he can never do on the battlefield is take his life for granted, Yusato explains that he obviously doesn't want to die but this just makes Rose call him an idiot again. Talk is cheap as Rose knows plenty of people that talk the way he does and died anyway, being part of the rescue squad means that he must save himself too, so he shouldn't underestimate the value of his own life. Rose doesn't want to hear any self-sacrificing talk from him or she promises to end his life before the enemy does. Yusato hears her message loud and clear and confidently declares that he will save everyone, including himself. She questions if he can really do it but he reminds Rose that she was the one that told him to speak his ideals. Yusato thinks about the vision he saw and determines that it doesn't matter if it really is the future, he knows what he must do and that is to not let Kazuki or Susan die no matter what. The story continues, we see the army is making its way to the battlefield. Yururu isn't too pleased that the journey is taking so long. Tong tells her they have no choice because they have to go far away from the castle to fight the demons. Yururu gets his point but Orga doesn't look too happy about the journey as well. Yusato asks Rose to tell him about demons, she tells him demons are demi-humans with unusually large horns. They look like humans at first glance, but they are superior in both strength and magic, she also tells him the demon commanders are very powerful but the common demon soldiers are push-offs. She wonders if the thought of demons scares Yusato, but he tells her he's fine because he knows someone scarier than the demons. Rose is impressed with how far he has come despite the circumstance of his choosing. Yusato tells her he's just doing everything he can to prove her wrong. This enrages Rose and Yusato puts up his hands thinking she will hit him but she doesn't retaliate, Rose feels nostalgic remembering her previous squad. Five years in the past, Rose walked towards the king's hall, the king was addressing the soldiers and telling them about the demons that were spotted on a plane close to the city. He told them it was only a matter of time before the demons attacked someone, he decided to assign guards to the merchants that traversed the plains. He tells them the guards will be assigned to soldiers lower than the general rank, he warns them to run if a fight breaks out because demons are stronger than humans. After the briefing Siglis asks Rose what she thinks the demons are planning, she tells him he has no idea but she guessed they are preparing for an invasion. Siglis wonders if they have the means and she tells him there's a possibility. Siglis tells her he'll ready the troops to mobilize at a moment's notice, but she tells him it would be a waste of time. He tells her they need to be able to mobilize instantly and she tells him he's too uptight, they go their separate ways and Rose decides to take his advice. Yul her subordinate calls out to her while she's thinking about her strategy, but she's lost in thought and doesn't answer. Yul keeps pestering her and she loses her patience, she hits Yul's head and tells her to be quiet. Yul complains that she almost split her head like a coconut with her brute strength, Rose tells her to keep quiet when she sees other people thinking and Yul realizes that she's mean. She tells Rose that she didn't think demons would show up and this prompts Rose to give her a two for one special smacking. She tells her she shouldn't listen in on classified information, she tells her to learn to stick to the rules. Yul wonders what the demons are up to and Rose tells her no one knows, Yul tells her all they have to do is drive the demons away if they invade and Rose warns her not to underestimate the demons. Yul tells her she's not underestimating them but Rose isn't convinced by her act, she tells Rose she bests those principles into her and Rose decides to oversee her training that afternoon. Yul tries to talk her out of it, she tells her she doesn't want to keep her busy since she's a commander now. They arrive at the squad barracks and everyone greets Rose, who is their captain and Yul, who is their vice captain. They notice Yul looks pale and they wonder why, Yul tries to hide it but Rose tells them she's going to retrain all of them and they all get pissed out. They think Yul said something to Rose to prompt her action and she tells them it's her gift to them because they have been slacking off. They proceed to mess her up and Rose walks away without caring, Yul begs her to intervene but Rose tells her it's none of her business. After a week, the king calls Rose for a private meeting and they meet on the balcony, he tells her that demons have been attacking other monsters in the territory, he tells her eyewitnesses saw a group of trained demon soldiers perpetrate the act. 
Rose is surprised that the attack was planned and coordinated, she becomes suspicious and the king tells her to find out the reason for the demon's actions. He authorizes her to use force if the need arises, he's sure she won't act harshly unless need be and she's grateful for his trust in her, she promises to deliver good results. Later at night, she briefs her squad and tells them they would be heading into the darkness of Linger, she tells them they would depart the next day. One of the soldiers asks her how many demons they would be expecting and she tells him about 30 have been sighted. Another soldier thinks fighting 30 demons would be problematic. Yul tries to cheer the squad but they're still pissed of her for making them train harder the past week. She tells them the training made them well toned for the mission but they throw several utensils at her. Rose decides to make her little bunny Kakuru stay home. Kakuru can detect monsters and she knows it could be useful but she doesn't want the demons to target it. She didn't want to put the Kakuru in danger. Yul rushes to her side for protection and the soldiers stop pummeling her. Rose tells the squad they will need to be at their very best for the mission so she'll tag along. The soldiers are hyped because they know they'll be unstoppable with Rose leading them. They know they don't have to worry about getting hurt because Rose can always heal them up and they decide to go all out for the mission. Yul riles up the group once again and this time they are hyped. Rose tells them to quit the chit chat and start preparing. The next day, they venture out for their mission and they searched around the linger, but they couldn't find any demons. As darkness descends they make a campfire, Yul tells them they will search the western side of the forest the next day, the soldiers know the western terrain isn't very good, so Yul tells them they would leave the horses behind. The soldier tells her they need to prioritize the areas they can search with horses, but Yul tells them she's sure there's something in the west. The soldiers decide to follow her lead, she tells them to take turns watching guard while others sleep but they all go to sleep. Rose takes the first watch so she tells Yule to get some sleep, while everyone is sleeping Rose notices that Yule is having trouble sleeping. She offers to put Yule to sleep herself and Yule is surprised she noticed she can't sleep, Yule joins her by the fire and she decides to confide in her. She asks Rose why she chose to make her the vice captain. She tells Rose, she's average compared to the other soldier and she knows nothing stands out about her. Rose realizes that she thinks she's not qualified for the role. Yul tells Rose she doesn't need a vice captain because she handles most things by herself. Rose tells her someone has to do the menial jobs and she's doing well because there have been no complaints about her. Yul tells her it's because she has been working hard and Rose tells her if she keeps working hard, she may become the captain. Rose reminds her that she can't keep being the captain of the squad now that she's a battalion commander. Yule protests that she can't become captain because everyone in the squad will end up taking each other's lives. She tells Rose she'll get beaten up and Rose is disappointed by her lack of faith in the squad. Yule tells her she doesn't want her to ever leave the squad and Rose sighs in exasperation. Yule tells her she never follows orders she doesn't agree with and she always does what she feels is right, even if everyone else disagrees. She tells Rose she'll shut up anyone who doesn't agree with her with force and Rose tells her she's quite famous for that. She tells her she heard of stories of a skillful soldier who was so stubborn she wouldn't obey the orders of a general that was when Rose came into Yule's life. Yule was thinking of doing the same thing and disobeying Rose's orders but nothing she tried worked. Whenever she disobeyed, Rose always put her in her place and she had no choice but to follow orders. At that time, Yule decided she won't give in to Rose and obey her, she decides to endure her hellish training just to prove her point. Rose remembered Yule becoming motivated all of a sudden, but she doesn't remember treating her any different. Yule tells her she became motivated because Rose didn't cast her out or turn her back on her, other captains usually got tired of her and would turn back on her but Rose kept facing her head on. Yule tells her it was annoying but she felt happy, and she's convinced the other soldiers also felt happy. She tells Rose no one else can be their captain because no one else understands them like she does. Rose walks up to her and gives her a spank on her head, she tells her to grow up and stop relying on her for everything. Yul is surprised by her reaction to her heartfelt confession, Rose tells her she won't pick someone who isn't qualified to replace her. She tells Yul she didn't pick her as the vice captain on a win, she realized that Yul never gave up once she made up her mind and she always stood strong regardless of the situation. She knows these qualities will motivate those around her to surpass their limits, she tells her to just be herself and people will follow her without question. Yul is shocked that Rose thinks people will follow her lead but Rose is surprised she doesn't know the power of her charisma. Rose tells her change is the only constant in the world, she tells her she needs to accept change and move forward regardless, she tells her nothing will change the fact that she was their captain and she tells her not to worry herself unnecessarily. Rose decides to get some sleep and Yule offers to take the next watch, 
Rose tells the other soldiers to get some sleep and Yul is surprised. They tell her they trust her to lead them in Rose's absence. They tell her they don't hate her and they always listen to her commands when it counts. They tell her not to worry so much and she becomes embarrassed. She chases them about and Rose smiles secretly. The next day, they climb up a little mountain and a soldier spots evidence of the demons, he informs Rose and they come forward to investigate. The soldiers realize the demons are hunting monsters and they wonder why they're hunting monsters instead of humans. Yul knows there must be a deeper reason behind it but they suddenly hear a deep growl from within the forest. Rose tells them to get ready to battle and they rush into the forest, they see the demons in a clearing. They just took down a wolf and were in the middle of packing them. They remain hidden behind the bushes but the chief demon senses their presence and informs the other demons, they reveal themselves and Rose tells Yul not to make a move yet. Rose walks out and she asks the demon what he's doing in their territory, both sides are tensed up and ready to fight. The demon tells her he doesn't like his mission but it benefits them in the long run. She asks him the details of his mission but he doesn't reveal it to her, she tells him he can avoid a fight if he turns tail and runs but he's pissed off by her arrogance. The demon can see that Rose is strong but he can't let her go because she knows about their mission, the demon promises to take their lives. Rose puts Yule in charge of the squad because she would be facing the chief demon, the demon knows only one of them will come out alive and Rose dares him to take her life. They engage in battle and Yule leads the other soldiers against the lesser demons, the demon creates an armor of wind and he sends wind slashes at Rose but she dodges it. She gets up close with him and tries to punch him but his shield blocks it. The demon is surprised she was able to dodge his attack and he tries to engage and talk mean jutsu but Rose shuts him up with a leg strike, he blocks it but she follows up with another strike. Rose gets a cut and she leaves her team in peel care to take in the demon. The demon tries to hide in the first and launch a sneak attack but Rose eventually finds him. She hurls a huge tree at him as he flees to block his way and then hurls several others but he shields himself, she brings one more tree down on him but he cuts through it. Rose keeps attacking him but his windshield blocks all her strikes, he's impressed with her strength and he tells her she's the most powerful human he has ever fought. He suddenly surrounds her with wind blades but she walks through it and he's surprised to see she has healing magic, she attacks him again but he blocks it. He can now see she's a one-man army and he decides to introduce himself as Nero, he summons his sword from the abyss and vows to put an end to Rose. Rose tells him she would beat the crap out of him before that happens, a fierce battle between both of them commences. The story continues, back at the other fight, one dude uses an ability to put a demon to sleep. Yule lands an attack as well and declares that they need to show the power of Rose's personal unit. Rose is busy fighting Nero and she realizes that his demon sword is imbued with a curse. She could not let it touch her no matter what, just that Nero does manage to cut her face but she lands a counter attack. He is sent back near the others, and Rose heals herself. She knows that Nero isn't done just yet, so she demands that he get up. Nero is impressed by her and her subordinates. They are quite skilled and easily the most troublesome group he has ever encountered. Nero thought that true heroes no longer existed among the humans. He has changed his mind however, as Rose and her groups have become their biggest obstacle. Nero's sword begins to glow with darkness, and he declares that the era in which demonkind trembles before the humans will end, as their lord will soon awaken. This lord is merciless savage and cruel, but he brings the demons blessings and victory. This guy shocks Rose when he releases a bunch of power and states that he must defeat her group so they can awaken their lord. The fight begins to turn as one of Rose's subordinates lands an attack, but she realizes that the demon isn't affected. The demon proclaims that they are simply weapons of the demon lord and if they lose their life, they will just take them down with them. Rose can tell that she is in trouble, so she rushes to her companion, but she is stopped by Nero. The demon stays true to his word and takes the girl's life, horrifying everyone. Another member of Rose's group gets eliminated, and it becomes clear that these demons no longer care about their own lives. Yul tries to calm everyone down, but it's no use as another one of their comrades falls. Nero takes credit for this turn in the fight, as he points out that he urged his men to sacrifice themselves. Rose attacks them with rage, but Nero points out that she has lost her composure and he cuts her eye. She tries to heal it, but Nero reveals that his sword cuts away mana. Her wound is cursed and she won't be able to heal it. Her troops are begging for some healing as they are being destroyed in the fight. Rose tries to end her fight with Nero, but it's no use. She can only see out of one eye, so it's affecting her sense of distance. Nero moves in for an attack and she realizes that it's all over. 
Nero lands a devastating attack, but Rose is shocked when she sees that you'll sacrifice her own life to save her. Rose is horrified to see that her entire unit has been eliminated. Rose feels terrible since they all believed in her. They all thought that they wouldn't die on her watch and she would always come to their rescue. Rose wishes that Yul would have just run away, and she blames herself for being so weak. Nero declares that the deaths of their subordinates will not be forgotten and he goes in to finish the fight. Just then he is shocked when Rose stops his blade. She begins to beat this guy down and insults him for what he said. The angry Rose points out that a demon like him who urged his own troops to sacrifice themselves could never understand. She continues absolutely destroying Nero and explains that sacrificing oneself in battle is the ultimate humiliation. Rose has completely taken over the fight as she pins Nero to a tree and she angrily states that she will now kill him. Rose can tell that her body is about to fail, but she is determined to be the one that ends Nero's life. Just then, young Amila appears worried about Nero, and Rose can't understand this at all. Nero is a demon that sacrifices his own subordinates, so she can't believe that there is one that wants to save him. Rose tries to stop her from rescuing him, but this girl reminds her of Yule. They leave and the real Yule cuts out to her, the greatly injured Rose makes her way to her trusty subordinate and she tells her to stop talking so she can heal her. Yule explains that healing her will be impossible since she was cut too deep. Rose finds this to be true as her healing fails, but she is determined to keep trying. Yule tells her that it's hopeless, but she states that she has no regrets. She was happy to fight by Rose's side, and she knows that the others felt the same. Rose can't believe what she is hearing and refuses to let her die. Yule uses her last word stats that Rose never change and she dies. A look around the battlefield reveals the massacre that just took place, and Rose screams in agony. Later, Rose reports to the king that the demon lord will soon be resurrected. Rose states that she no longer has the right to call herself a knight. Because of this, she would like for him to remove her as battalion commander and revoke her knighthood. Everyone is shocked, but the king does as she wishes. Later, the family of one of her fallen subordinates approaches her. She shamefully apologizes for not being able to protect him, but they thank her for at least bringing him back so they could see him one last time. They explain that their son was a complete delinquent since he just playing game all day long. However, when he started serving Rhodes, he became a changed man. Rose returns to her empty home and cries in a corner. A month later, Siglis goes to visit her and they discuss how the king came to see her earlier. Their goals are both the same, as they're checking to make sure that Rose hasn't decided to follow her troops to the afterlife. Rose considers it for a moment, but this just upsets Siglis. Rose tells him to calm down though as she wasn't being serious. Rose explains that the demon's curse was only temporary, so her wounds are starting to finally heal. Siglis wonders why she hasn't made an effort to heal her eye, but she doesn't answer. However, when she's alone, Rose thinks about how this scar is proof of her sin and letting her subordinates die. It's a punishment, so she never forgets what happened. Rose has decided to cherish her own life, since you'll sacrifice herself for it. The question now is what she will do with it. She considers getting revenge and defeating as many demons as she can, but that's not the answer. Rose manages to calm herself down, and she begins to have memories of everyone. She just now realizes how weak she really is and wonders what her subordinates would think of her if they saw her now. She imagines you'll next to her and you'll point out that they would probably laugh at her. You'll repeat the words that Rose told her by the fire and reminds her that things change. She must accept that so she can move forward. However, the fact that Rose let them will never change. They both say that they shouldn't overthink everything and you'll glad to see that she remembered. You'll remind her of her last words and those were that Rose should never change. The others appear to agree with you, and they remind her that Rose would punch him right in the face if she saw them acting the way she is. Rose realizes now how foolish she has been for just focusing on their deaths. Her subordinates were not like this, as they always look straight ahead with smiles on their faces. Rose snaps out of her depression and vows to never show weakness again. Her subordinates leave, and Rose promises to be someone that they can all admire. Rose removes her bandages and declares that she knows what she must do. A massive battle against the Demon Lord will be coming soon, so she has decided to create a force that saves lives. Many soldiers will be sent to their doom but she vows not to let them die. Her force will need at least five people, and two of them have to be healers to start with. Most importantly though, they will need someone like herself. Someone who doesn't just heal, but a healer who can run around the battlefield taking out threats as they go. This would be impossible for a normal person, but if she can find someone like that, then they might have a chance of fighting by her side without dying. Back to the present, Rose startles Yusato when she reveals that she is glad she found him. 
Rose points out that he doesn't even know how precious his own life is. Not just any healer can get as strong as he is by just training. She asks him to wonder what the world would be like if it had more healers like herself, but Yusato just uses his smart mouth to say that the world would be destroyed. Rose explains that she came up with the technique to train herself beyond her limits by using healing magic. It's incredibly difficult, and Yusato and herself are the only two people that can do it. Yusato has all their traits she has ever wanted in a healer, and she is sure that he won't die. Yusato takes in all the compliments, but Rose takes one look at his cheesy grin and is disgusted by it. Elsewhere, Amila is told that the bridge has been completed. The demon knight is glad to hear that, and Amila reminds him that he can go as wild as he wants when the battle starts. This guy is confident as he warns that the battle might end in an instant, since they are just up against humans. Amila reminds him not to underestimate them, as they have the ones known as kidnappers. These kidnappers steal the wounded, but the knight isn't worried about them. He just thinks they run away all the time, but Amila points out that they are actually monsters. The knight is glad to hear that they might be able to make things interesting. He doesn't care what they are as long as they make him feel alive. The story continues, we see soldiers set up camp with several barricades around to protect them through the night. Some soldiers are standing around talking while others are sleeping. Yusato steps out at his tent in the early hours of the morning to calm himself, since that was the day of the battle. Susan suddenly calls out to him and she's surprised he's wearing a matching outfit with Rose. Yusato wonders what she's doing outside so early and she tells him she went out for a morning walk. She turns around to show him her armor, and she wonders what he thinks about it. Yusato isn't sure of what to say, and she pressures him to compliment her armor. She decides to tell him more about the armor, though he didn't tell her wants to know more about it. She tells him the armor boosts her lightning magic without hindering her magic. She shows off her joint movement and Yusato can see she's really happy with how fitting the armor is. Yusato wonders if she prefers wearing armor to cute clothing, and she tells him she prefers cute stuff since she was cultivating cactuses at home to comfort herself. Yusato tells her cactuses are cute and she asks him to be her object of comfort them. He tells her he's already lost her, but she tells him she knows he's just hiding his feelings. She asks him to be truthful to himself and stop being a sundir, but he tries to calm her down. She pressures him to get along with her so they can always share their feelings with each other, but he begs her to stop. He tells her to communicate with words since that's what humans use, but she tells him actions speak louder than words sometimes. She corners him because she wanted to give him some action, but Yusato calls out to Kazuki to save him. Kazuki immediately manifests and he holds Susan at bay. Yusato is surprised Kazuki came to his rescue, but Susan tells him to let her go. Kazuki tells her Siglis is calling them to assemble, and she tells him she will only answer his summons after she makes Yusato her own. Yusato bags Kazuki to take her away and he agrees to Yusato's request. Kazuki promises to return to Yusato and make him comfort her by force. Kazuki waves him goodbye and he thanks him for saving him. Yusato looks at the sunrise and he smiles in anticipation of the upcoming battle. Siglis gives Kazuki and Susan reports from the scouts, he tells them the Demon Lord army would be arriving at the battlefront soon. He tells them the mages will hit the enemy with a barrage of magic before both of them will engage them. He tells them to carve a path through the enemy lines to the enemy's general and take him down if possible. He tells them to do their best to bring back good news to the king. They stand outside the barricade awaiting the Demon King's forces. Susan tells Kazuki not to push himself too hard, but he tells her she doesn't have to worry about him because he'll be fine. Kazuki wonders why she's so worried that she has to distract herself with Yusato, and she's surprised he figured that out. She tells him that though she's worried, she also feels empowered. Kazuki realizes she's now different from the way she was back in their old world, and she tells him her old self is gone. She's happy Yusato accepts her for who she is now, and Kazuki didn't know about that. He asks her to give him more details, but she tells him now is not the time to share such information. She promises to give him more details when they are safe, and Kazuki realizes he'll only get more details if they make it through the battle. Susan tells him they definitely have to make it through the battle alone so she can share the story. Suddenly something catches their attention from a distance. They keep looking and they don't see anything, but they can feel the presence of the demons as they approach. The demon army suddenly comes into view and Susan orders the mages to ready their magic since they'll be making the first move. She wonders if Kazuki is ready and he tells her he has no choice but to be ready, the mage is ready their staff, and they all attack the demons with their magic spells. Kazuki is happy their attacks hurt the demon army, but when their view clears up they realize the army was just an illusion. 
Kazuki wonders where the real army is when Sigli suddenly notices the demons coming from a direction without barricades. Kazuki and Susan rush over to that direction to intercept the demon army. Rose orders soldiers and her healing unit to head out into the battlefield and bring back anyone who's injured to her. She orders them to go and return back to her alive, and they rush towards the battlefield. Rose stations Orga and Yururu at the tent with the guards standing with them for protection. She tells them to make a run for it, if anything happens. She tells Yusato they'll both head into the battlefield after some time elapses, but they would heal the wounded at the tent, in the meantime. She orders everyone to their stations and Yusato wonders if Suzu and Kazuki are alright. Yururu wonders if he's worried about his friends and he tells her he's worried. She tells him to take care of himself too, since he'll be heading into the battlefield soon. One of Rose's soldiers return with some wounded, and they're shocked there are soldiers that are already wounded. Rose tells them to expect more wounded since they are at war, and she tells them to get to healing the soldiers. Yusato looks at a soldier and he sees her injuries are bad, he decides to heal her right away while the soldiers are bringing in more wounded. She tells him a big snake blew her away, and Yusato wonders if it's the same snake he saw in his vision. He decides to focus on healing the soldier first. Meanwhile, in the battlefield the soldiers are facing a giant snake. They can't believe the demons have such a huge snake at their disposal. They tried to keep their guard up against the snake, but they are helpless against it. The Black Knight is so disappointed in humans, he didn't see the need for him to be in the battlefield because they are so weak. A soldier charges him from behind and runs his sword through the Black Knight. The soldier is happy he took the Black Knight down but he's wounded, the demon is even more disappointed at how weak humans are. The soldier falls to the ground, wondering how he was wounded so fatally. The Black Knight removes the soldier's sword from his guts and his wounds heal up. The soldier tries to crawl back to camp and inform the soldiers about the Black Knight. The Black Knight is impressed by his tenacity but he decides to put an end to him. He is suddenly distracted by sticky water and when he looks back the soldier is gone. The soldier is saved by one of Rose's soldiers and the Black Knight wonders who the soldier is. The soldier remembers when Amila told him about strong soldiers on the enemy side, and he realizes she was talking about soldiers like this. He's happy with how fun the enemies are making the battle. Lightning suddenly strikes behind him twice, and he decides to investigate what's going on in that area. Another healing corp returns a soldier, and the tent is almost overcrowded. Rosa decides it's time for them to head into the battlefield, and she asks Yusato if he's ready. Yusato tells her he's ready because she has trained him to be her right-hand man. She's glad she doesn't have to worry about him, and Yusato is surprised she was worried at all. She leaves Olga and Yururu in charge of the healing tent, and they encourage her to heal up the soldiers in the battlefield. They leave the tent and Rose tells the guard to take care of the healers. They rush into battle and Rose tells Yusato she heard something from a soldier. She tells him about the strongest demon, who is a black knight with black armor that took down the soldier using peculiar magic. She warns him to be careful and Yusato remembers the black knight from his vision. He suddenly stops in his tracks and Rose wonders what is wrong with him, but he denies anything being wrong. She decides to give him one more piece of advice. She realizes that he can't take anyone's life, and he tells her his role is to save lives. She thinks he's an idiot for saying that at the face of death and she decides to use her special techniques to cure his idiocy. She tells him how to defeat an enemy he had to take down by all means, Yusato is marveled by the technique, and he wonders if she thought up that technique just for him. He thanks her for the free advice, and they decide to go separate ways. As Yusato runs through the battlefield, he sees several bodies on the ground. He gets to the heat of battle and he sees a demon about to finish a soldier off. He rescues the soldier and heals him quickly, but one of the demons intercepts him. The demon attacks him, but Yusato dodges and keeps running while healing the soldier. Rose, on the other hand, is using demons as stepping stones to fly through the battlefield and heal soldiers who are hurt. Yusato heals up the soldiers and he asks them to take a little rest or exit the battlefield if they can't continue. Susan clears out most of the front lines and she orders the commander to withdraw the injured soldiers from battle while she charges ahead. Kazuki joins up with her and they decide to keep clearing the path to the general. Kazuki tells her about the giant snake and they decide to take it down after completing their objective. Susan tells the soldiers to follow her, but the Black Knight suddenly marches up to her with some demons. Everyone is surprised by the Dark Knight's appearance, Susan realizes the knight is stronger than any demon they faced so far, so she tells her soldiers to stay back. Her soldiers pay her no mind and they charge toward the knight. She begs them to fall back, 
but they attack the knight with their spears. They think they've heard the knight, and Kazuki wonders why the knight isn't resisting in. Susan realizes the knight doesn't feel pain, and the knight attacks the soldiers. Susan begs them to fall back again, but they're suddenly wounded. Kazuki is about to attack the knight to get revenge from the soldiers, but Susan hits him, which makes his attack graze the knight's shoulder. Kazuki wonders why she stopped him, and she tells him he shouldn't land a direct hit on the knight. She realizes the knight's uses reflect magic, and Kazuki suddenly gets injured on his shoulder. Susan is surprised that the reflected magic passed through his armor. She wonders if he's alright, and he tells her it was just a scratch. She is happy, she was able to figure out that the knight's armor reflects any attack on it back to the attacker thanks to his rashness. The knight tells her no one has ever figured out his abilities so fast before. He tells her not to run away from him because she seems very strong and intelligent. Yusato is running through the battlefield when he suddenly gets flashbacks of his vision. He tries to use his healing magic to make it go away but it doesn't help. A demon is about to take him down in his weakened state, but he gets to his feet. He keeps running but he trips and falls and the demon is about to attack him again, but the soldier he just healed saves him. He asks the soldier for the location of the heroes and he tells him they are at the front lines. Yusato decides to head to the front lines and he hopes both Kazuki and Susan are still alive when he arrives. The soldiers are fighting the demons on the front lines, so Susan and Kazuki decide to take on the knight while the other demons are distracted. Kazuki wonders what they can do against the knight since he reflects their attacks, but Susan tells him her plan. He thinks it would be too dangerous, but she tells him they'll have Yusato heal them if anything goes awry. The knight sees they're ready to battle him and he engages them. They rush towards him while dodging his attack and Susan casts her magic, which hits the ground and obstructs the knight's vision. They run into the dust and attack the knight, but he reflects their attacks. Susan was hoping the knight can't reflect attacks he can't see, but she was wrong. She suddenly notices the attack on the knight's back wasn't reflected, so she decides to give her strategy another try. The knight uses tentacles from its armor to attack them, but they dodge its attacks. Susan uses her lightning skill to increase her speed, and she moves behind the knight. Kazuki realizes her plan, and he decides to blind the knight. The knight is getting bored of their strategy, but Susan suddenly attacks him from behind and the knight is hurt. Susan realizes the knight can't reflect an attack he doesn't perceive. She tells Kazuki to attack the knight since he can't reflect the attack, but as soon as Kazuki attacks the knight, he triggers his reflex skill. Susan is surprised the knight was able to fool them into attacking him. The knight injured Kazuki while his reflex skill injured Susan. He tells Susan he fooled her into believing that he can't reflect attacks and he can't perceive by intentionally not reflecting the attack in his back. He tells her no one has ever injured him and no one will ever injure him. Yusato keeps running to the front lines, but he's too late. Susan falls to her knees disappointed that she failed Yusato. The story continues, we see Susan flash back into the past, shows Kazuki and Susan complimenting each other for successfully improving the school regulations. This was the moment just before Susan found Yusato without an umbrella. Susan thinks about how she was really lucky to meet him that day. She was really happy about being summoned to a new world, and she couldn't wait to start over as her new self. Yusato was completely different though, since he knew exactly what he needed to do in order to live in this new world. More important than anything though, Susan was extremely happy that he accepted who she really was, not the fake Susan from before. She always believed that everything would be fine as long as she had Kazuki and Yusato by her side. Unfortunately, that isn't the case as we return to the present and Susan collapses before the Black Knight. The other demon celebrates this achievement and the Black Knight prepares to end Susan's life for good. He commends her for making it fun and prepares to slice her head off. Just then, Yusato declares that the Black Knight will not do such a thing on his watch, and he unleashes a powerful punch until the Black Knight's face. Yusato was horrified though, when he realizes that he didn't make it in time to save his friends. Things start looking up when he begins to heal them, but the Black Knight is furious. She demands to know who attacked her, and Susan notices that the Black Knight is actually a girl. She attacks our heroes, but Yusato runs off with his friends. He just manages to avoid an attack from a demon, and Susan follows up with an attack of her own. Susan is all healed up now, and Kazuki should be fully healed soon. Susan has something urgent to tell Yusato, but they're interrupted by the Black Knight. Before the Black Knight can get to them, Susan manages to tell Yusato everything she knows about the Black Knight's armor. It's most likely made of mana, and it can reflect any attack back in the attacker. Yusato's attack somehow managed to work against it though, so Susan wonders what kind of attack it was. 
they are interrupted again by the Black Knight who wants revenge, and Yusato just thinks about how he really doesn't want to fight. He wants to heal the other soldiers though, so he doesn't really have a choice. Suzum becomes worried as he prepares to fight, but Yusato just tells her to watch over Kazuki. Yusato covers himself in healing magic and quickly learns that the Black Knight's armor can morph. He decides to attack anyway, since even if his attacks are reflected back to him, he can always just heal himself. Yusato realizes that his attacks aren't being reflected at all, and he wonders if the Black Knight is just out of mana. The Black Knight is even surprised by this, so Yusato decides to go in for a two-punch combo. The Furious Black Knight demands that he just die already, but Yusato just keeps fighting back. Kazuki regains consciousness, and Susan tells them that Yusato saved their lives. Just then, the Black Knight celebrates, as she pierces right through Yusato's hand, but everyone is shocked when it becomes clear that the Black Knight's terrifying attacks have no effect on him. Kazuki can't understand what's going on, as Yusato was constantly in a healing state. Wanting to continuously heal his wounds and fatigue makes sense, but at this rate he is healing his enemy with every punch. Just end Susan realizes that the Black Knight's weakness must be healing magic. Yusato manages to surprise the Black Knight and lands his most powerful punch yet. Reflect isn't working because Yusato's fists are enveloped in healing magic. The injuries he is inflicting are immediately being healed, so the damage of Black Knight is taking is purely from the power of Yusato's fists. His attacks aren't actually leaving any wounds, they're just extremely painful. Susan thinks this style of fighting is the craziest she has ever seen, and it's definitely the wrong way to use healing magic. The Black Knight can't believe she's losing like this, so she releases a massive amount of power that pushes Yusato all the way back to his friends. They are still worried about him, but he assures them that he will finish the fight right now. The Black Knight is preparing some kind of massive attack, but Yusato couldn't care less. He knows what he must do, as he just needs to make sure that the Black Knight can't hurt anyone anymore. Yusato powers himself up with his healing magic and the two opponents charge at each other. They both come to an abrupt stop, as their powers collide and they struggle to see who will come out on top. Yusato pushes himself beyond all limits, eventually overpowering the Black Knight, and he lands the most powerful punch ever seen. The war around them has stopped as everyone watches the insane fight. Yusato's attack aim into turn of healing magic and it removes the Black Knight's armor completely. Yusato is victorious and he declares that this attack shall be known as the ultimate healing punch. Yusato immediately gets to healing the other soldiers, and they credit him for being the reason that all the other demons fled. It's all because he defeated their Black Knight, and Susan points out that there would have been far more casualties if he hadn't won the fight. Susan tells the soldier to get out of there, as she wants to learn more about this ultimate healing punch technique that Yusato came up with. Yusato explains that it's actually just a normal punch imbued with healing magic, and Rose taught him how to use it. A look back shows that this was the secret thing Rose told him about, the idea is that you cover your punch and healing magic so that the attacks don't eliminate the opponent. The attacks will heal the enemy as he punches them, until he eventually knocks them out. They aren't injured, but they feel the pain and the impact. This way he can immobilize an enemy without hurting them. Yusato thinks it's pretty awesome and Susan realizes that he's really starting to fall under Rose's influence. Susan thanks him for coming for them, and Yusato explains that he was just helping his friends. The giant snake has moved to the front lines, so Susan decides that this is where they will have to fight next. Yusato plans to go with them, but Rosa demands know what happened. Rose is surprised to hear that we settle already took care of everything, and commends him for saving his friends, defeating the Black Knight and dealing a massive blow to the enemy's morale. The battlefield is under control now and they will just get in the soldiers' way if they keep running around, so she decides that they should head back to camp. Yusato informs his friends, and they promise to treasure their lives that Yusato works so hard to save, they say their goodbyes for now and Yusato runs off. Under her breath, Rose comments Yusato for managing to stay alive, but she pretends like she didn't say anything. At the enemy camp, Amila shocked to hear that the Black Knight was completely and utterly defeated. She refuses to believe that someone overcame her magic, and is even more startled when she learns that it was someone from the rescue team. She assumes that it was Rose, but she is told that it was someone else. Amila can't believe that there's another person like Rose, and she decides that they must withdraw. She considered going out to fight herself, but that will leave their base vulnerable, and the enemy still has Siglis on their side. Hiraluk prepares to go get their giant snake, but he is stunned when he sees that the heroes have beaten to it. They refuse to let Yusato down, and they prepare to eliminate it. Back at campus, 
Yusato hard at work healing soldiers, but he must tell one of the meatheads that he isn't messing around. Everyone is busy healing, and they're all then amazed when they see the massive attack by the heroes. Yusato's friends are exhausted, but they manage to defeat the giant snake and everyone celebrates. Rose informs Yusato that the enemy is retreating, and he wonders if they're going to chase after them. She calls him an idiot since the demons outnumber them by a lot. Their focus now is to keep casualties down while they prepare for the next attack. Rose declares that they won this battle because Yusato managed to save the heroes. Yusato was humble as always, since he is sure that Rose would have come if he didn't, but this is not the case. Rose reveals that the heroes would have died, and he most definitely saved them. They might even lost the entire battle, so Rose finally compliments him on a job well done as a member of the rescue squad. Our protagonist Yusato takes it all in, as he has memories of all the hard work he put in up to this point. He has been through a whole lot, so Yusato begins to tear up. He can't even understand why, and Rose realizes that he is more of a kid than she thought. Yusato admits that he was actually really scared on the battlefield. The demons were terrifying and he saw a lot of people lose their lives. However, Yusato is still glad to have met Rose, since that has allowed him to save a lot of people. Rose explains that she wants new people that said the same type of things, but they only exist in her memories now. Yusato's still there, so she finally compliments him on doing a good job, coming back to her alive. Yusato happily takes her praise, but he is exhausted and passes out. Rose is proud of him for hanging in there for this long, so she allows him to get some much-needed rest. The story continues, we see Yusato explains that he was summoned to the castle after returning from the war. He was really nervous at first, but he was pretty happy since he received his first reward he has ever gotten in his entire life. Blurin is too busy eating to listen to what he's saying, and Yusato wonders if the little bear has gained some weight. Gomo arrives to tell him that he has been summoned to the castle again, but warns him to be careful when going through town, Yusato wonders why but Gom doesn't say. Yusato finds out for himself soon after though, as a crowd of townspeople form around him. Our protagonist is overwhelmed by all the attention, so he doesn't notice the mysterious girl is nearby. Yusato gets away from the crowd and the guard thanks him for saving his comrades. Yusato points out that everyone was just doing their part in the war and the soldiers also protected him. The kid is glad to hear that Yusato wouldn't mind having him as his bodyguard one day, and the kid's friend points out how he is strong enough to join the royal knights. Yusato goes to speak with the king, who asks him to lend them his strength. Yusato of course agrees, so Siglis reveals that they need his help to interrogate the Black Knight. Yusato wonders if she has been violent to others, but they reveal that she surprisingly doesn't hold much loyalty to the Demon Lord's army. She has been answering their questions willingly, but they haven't been able to get the most critical information from her. They want to know the magic system of the commanding officers and their powers. She has agreed to answer these questions, but only if she gets to see Yusato first. Susan escorts him to go see the Black Knight, and she promises to protect him if she tries anything. Yusato quick to point out that Susan already lost to her before, so she vows to at the very least, be a meat shield for him. Yusato can't even understand how he defeated the Black Knight, but Siglis knows why. The Black Knight has an affinity for black magic, but it seems to have been cancelled out by Yusato's healing magic. Yusato realizes that their magic cancelled each other out, and he begins to panic as he realizes something else. His healing magic being cancelled out means that he wasn't healing her and he wonders if she has received medical attention. She hasn't because she has been wearing her armor since she regained consciousness, so Yusato rushes to see her. He knows that she must be hurt since she was just taking all his punches directly without any of the healing. Yusato's fists can shatter boulders, so he knows her wounds must be bad. The Black Knight doesn't care and just accepts that she will live in pain. Susan breaks the tension and points out that she must be some kind of masochist, but Yusato was not amused. The Black Knight isn't even sure about why she wanted to see Yusato, and assumes that it's because she wanted to meet the person that messed her up so badly. Yusato makes Siglis let him into the cell and he asks for her hand. She assumes that he wants to torture her, but he just demands that she listen to him. Yusato begins healing her, but she panics as it also begins to remove her armor. Yusato tells her to just let him heal her, and she calms down as she also realizes that healing feels nice. Yusato would like his hand back, but she wants to hold on for a little longer as she has never felt such a nice feeling. Tears pour down her face, so Yusato determined that he can't say no. Afterwards, Rose decides that she will personally train Yusato again since the Demon Lord's army will be attacking again. 
There are some things she wants him to learn so he can be prepared and Yusato states that he does want to level up his healing magic. He still can't heal complicated things like illnesses, but he's disappointed to hear that that is too far out of his reach right now. His physical abilities are at an acceptable level, so they won't train that either. Yusato wonders what they will be doing then, and he is shocked and Rose simply says that she will be punching him. She's going to punch him faster than he can react and his job will be to simply dodge. Rose keeps him from getting away and points out that he relies too much on his healing magic. Healing magic won't work on wounds made by weapons that curse the wound, so he needs to learn to dodge. Yusato gets upset about her wanting to punch her subordinate, but she is just glad to see him so energized. She launches him into the sky, but he manages to land safely. Rose tells him not to block her next attack, and she blasts him right in the stomach. Sometime later Yusato wakes up and determined that all that must have been a nightmare. It wasn't though, as Rose was just waiting for him to regain consciousness, and she points out that he should be happy, since she was holding back before. Yusato thanks her and they start training again. Three training fill days pass and Yusato complains about how horrible it's been. Whenever he gets close to dodging her attacks, Rose just throws punches even faster. Yusato offends his frustrations to the Black Knight, but she just wonders what he's doing there. Yusato doesn't have training today and just wonders what the Black Knight will do now. She points out that she's in prison and becomes shy right when she was about to ask him something. Yusato leaves and we see that Rose has gone to meet with the king, who has two requests for her. Yusato goes to see Kazuki, who's doing some interesting looking training, and Celia explains that he decided that he needs to become stronger. Yusato sees how much Celia admires Kazuki while he trains, and he becomes upset when he compares it to how horrible his training is. Celia explains that they were able to get the information they wanted from the Black Knight. It's all thanks to Yusato, and the king's trust in him only continues to grow. Kazuki trusts him a lot as well, as he begins to point out that he would be dead if it wasn't for Yusato. Kazuki stops himself though, since he doesn't want to worry Celia, and he goes back to training. Yusato eventually leaves, but Celia demands to know what Kazuki was going to say. On his way home Yusato wonders what will happen to the Black Knight, and he fears that they might want to end her life. Back in this cell, the Black Knight wonders what Yusato was thinking when he came to see her. She hears footsteps though, and eagerly wonders if it's Yusato. It turns out to be Rose, and she reveals that the king sent her. Rose explains that the Black Knight has two options. The first is to spend the rest of her life in the prison cell. She begins to tell her the second, but the Black Knight assumes that they want to end her life. Rose reveals that she isn't that lucky, and she opens the cell. The Black Knight begins to panic, and Rose explains that the second option is to let Rose take her under her wing. The Black Knight thinks the idea is crazy, but Rose shows her what crazy really is, as she karate chops her in her head, Rose then puts a magic tool on her that seals mana. She declares that watching over her in prison would be a waste of the kingdom's resources, so the only way to go is to turn her into an upright demon. The Black Knight thought she had two options, but Rose has already made the choice for her. The Black Knight fears what she's planning to do and Rose knocks her out. Back home, Yusato runs with Blurin to help him get back in shape. Rose gives him a good kick since he's supposed to be taking the day off, and he is shocked to see that she has the Black Knight with her. He demands to know what's going on, so Rose explains that she's going to reform the knight as an errand runner for the rescue team. Her magic is sealed and Rose will be supervising her training, so there's nothing to worry about. She will do to her what she did to Yusato, so he pities the poor demon when she wakes up. That night Yusato reports to Rose, Black Knight did a lot of complaining, but she calmed down with a bath and went to bed. Rose then reveals that the king wants to ally with other countries to stand against the demon lord's army. The king needs messengers to deliver messages to these countries, and he has chosen Susan Kazuki and Yusato. Yusato can't believe that the king would choose him, and Rose points out that he has a lot of trust in him. The fate of the entire kingdom depends on this mission, and Rose agrees with the king that Yusato will be able to complete it. The next day, some Yusato's fangirls wish him luck and run off. A vendor apologizes for everyone swarming him the other day, but Yusato says it's fine. Yusato then thinks about how nice all the townspeople are and reminds himself that his mission will help protect them. Susan calls it fate when she finds him, but Yusato points out that it's pretty common to see people at this market. Just then Yusato passed the mysterious fox girl and rushes after her. He captures her and demands that they talk, but he is shocked when she says that she has been waiting for him. It's time for Yusato to pay her back and she demands that he save her mother. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.